Dr. Kless start, start us off here. He's got uh, some things to, to show us and, um, and then we'll be able to do some updates and, and, and get on with this. And uh, had a really wonderful, I know a couple people on this call, or at least one in addition to me was uh, at your ribbon cutting and uh, last week, very exciting. Um, so Dr. Kless, take it away. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present this morning. Um, I've, offended, I've attended a few uh, Golden Valley Business Council meetings in the past and uh, plan, to be, plan to be there in the future as well. So um, as Brent mentioned, uh, my name is Dr. Tim Klesk. I'm a partner in Forward Spine Center, which is a, it's a newer business here in Golden Valley. We just opened up in August. Um, I'll get a PowerPoint up here and running, but I just want to say thanks to Brent and thanks for the Minneapolis Chamber for uh, organizing the ribbon cutting. I know we had a good showing from the chamber as well as the city of Golden Valley. Maurice was there, Cherry and Shep. So um, it was fun. We'll have a bigger open house for the community and friends and family that everyone will be invited to here once it warms up a little bit. So let me share my screen here and I'll get this PowerPoint up and running. <clears throat> Now, can everybody see that? Perfect. So, as I mentioned, Forward Spine Center, we opened up in August of 2021. So, you know, kind of an unusual time to open a business, some might think, uh, with the pandemic going on. And um, in general, just the world in kind of a little bit of a different routine. So, uh, Forward Spine Center. When I think of the word forward, a few things come to mind. Let's let's dissect that word forward a little bit. Um, to me, you know, when I think of forward, I think of forward thinking. So kind of how we align ourselves here is, you know, we're, we're more evidence-based. We're always uh, chasing the newest research and things to implement with our patients to get them feeling better as quick as possible. We take a comprehensive approach where you know, we're more than just a chiropractic clinic. We offer acupuncture, um, a lot of rehabilitation. My wife's a yoga instructor, uh, and we're both chiropractors by trade. So we like to offer, you know, a lot of different approaches in our clinic, as we know that not everyone responds to the same thing. Um, and as, as well, being a newer business, we're working on collaborating a lot more with other healthcare practitioners, other healthcare professionals in Golden Valley here. Um, working with uh, medical doctors, physical therapists, so like we said, finding the right avenue for the patient to go down to get to where they want to be the quickest. Um, and that being said, I mean, we are more of a natural healthcare clinic. Um, here, we don't, we don't do a lot of prescription medication, surgeries. Those things are definitely warranted in a lot of situations. But we always recommend starting out with those conservative approaches. If those don't seem to be getting down to the bottom of it, let's move down and, and start some medication, injections, or whether it's a surgical candidate, um, get those things in motion as well. So uh, the big thing, the big question these days is, you know, say Brent woke up yesterday and he had some newer back pain that he has never experienced before. You know, I think a lot of the confusion right now in today's society is, well, what do I do? You know, where do I go? A lot of people go on online and you know, ask Dr. Google what's going on. People might top and see their MD. They might go to the massage therapist, physical therapist, chiropractic. There's a lot of different things out there, a lot of different solutions. So we want to kind of figure out what's best for the patient. And we always feel like that first stop should be more of a conservative stop before we uh, approach medication and injections and things down that way. So let's dive in a little bit. I figured we'd start with a little bit of humor this morning. I know Betsy, I, I did do a presentation with Rotary. I've, I've kind of updated this one a little bit, so there might be some twists and turns in there. Uh, but I always think uh, we'll start off the morning with, all right, perfect. <laughs> so on the left there, um, you know, typical Minnesota Vikings fan, right? Uh, Minnesota Vikings posture towards the end of the game, uh, which can be referred to as a scoliosis. Then on the right side there, um, looks like the doctor is walking up to his receptionist and says, uh, Gloria, I would really appreciate it if you'd stop greeting the patients with welcome to the crack house. Um, and obviously with you know, chiropractic adjustments, some forms of them, there can be some of that noise and 
patients love that. Patients can be a little bit uh, uneasy about that. So that's always kind of fun when, uh, when patients ask and inquire about what exactly that noise entails. So who are we at Ford Spine Center? Um, my wife and I, Dr. Madeline Klesk, we founded the clinic. Um, you know, we're both chiropractors by trade, but we've dabbled in a lot more than that and uh, like to have a, a nice toolbox full of multiple tools that we can kind of uh, implement with each patient as needed. As you can see there, uh, Madeline is also an acupuncturist. She's a yoga instructor. So we offer a lot more than just chiropractic care at the clinic. Um, I recently finished a program through the University of Pittsburgh that deemed me as a certified primary spine practitioner. So what does that mean? Uh, essentially, it just piggybacks off of my recent uh, point of people don't know where to go and who to see when they're struggling with some of these ailments, pains, you know, whether it's something that's limiting their activities or the things they enjoy. So the primary spine practitioner is put in place to be the first portal of entry or the person of contact when someone is having those types of pains and aches and they need help and they need guidance on where to go, um, whether it is seeking out medical care or starting with those conservative approaches, we can kind of screen and classify and get patients to where they need to be, uh, which has been super fun kind of putting into play here um, since we opened up in August. On the right there, you'll see a picture of uh, my wife, Madeline and I. This was the, actually the day we opened. So August 9th of last year, and you can see she's, she's quite pregnant in this photo. So three weeks after we opened up, uh, we got a little bit of a surprise and our, our newest employees arrived a little bit early. So these are our, uh, these are our twins here. That's, that's Miles on the left and uh, Nora on the right. Like I said, they, they surprised us a little bit early. We were just finding our rhythm three weeks into uh, opening the practice and uh, got thrown a curveball, which I've been told is something to get used to as a business owner. So that's been fun. It's all been great. Everything's been And a parent, it. Tim. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh, so, no, it's been, it's been a ton of fun and it's introduced a little bit more of a family dynamic, which is carried over to our practice and our clinic as well. So talking about that fi family dynamic, you'll, you'll see a lot of those signs here in the clinic. Um, but personally for my wife and I, it just, it was all about balance and starting our own practice. So, you know, we could afford to have a little bit more free time and a work-life balance to spend time with our family, um, dictate our schedules, those types of things. We were uh, separately associating at practices for the past seven years. So this has kind of been something that's been in the making for a while. Um, on the right there, you'll see a photo of Madeline. She loves working with children. Um, if there's, you know, eight month pregnant patients walking around in here, you can probably uh, imagine that Madeline's in the office that day. So we bring a lot of families in here. And um, like I said, our family dynamic kind of trickles over into the energy in our clinic as well. So why did we uh, set up shop in Golden Valley? Um, a lot of reasons. Um, I would say that it was more of a family decision than it was a business decision. Uh, I'd be lying if I said business you know, wasn't a huge portion of that thinking. But Golden Valley is where we plan on setting up, you know, the future with our family. And I've also have some roots in Golden Valley personally. Um, so my mother was born and raised in Golden Valley. And my grandparents raised her and uh, lived here for many, many decades. I remember as a child going over to their house, um, playing at the playground at Good Shepherd. So I think, um, you know, bringing our family into the community as well as owning a business is definitely in our near future as our family's growing and our, our house over in Northeast Minneapolis is getting a little bit smaller. Uh, another big factor was the community. You know, we enjoy the community feel. Um, I've, I've had a pleasure to be part of Golden Valley Rotary. You know, like you said, some of these things, the Golden Valley Business Council, a lot of other opportunities there. Uh, the trails and parks, we're a very active family. We enjoy biking, running, um, big golf courses here, play a lot of golf. And obviously the school systems are very strong as well. 
So, you know, we, we plan on being more than just a business in the community, but raising our family here and growing some of those relationships as well. So where are we located in Golden Valley? Uh, we're just north of Highway 55. We're right behind Red Lobster, kind of kitty corner to Culver's there. Uh, we're the end cap space right on Decatur. So pretty easy to get to, pretty central in location. Um, and it's, it's worked out really well. Um, it's hard to complain. It's a, it's a busy area. We've gotten a chance to meet a lot of the local business owners who are all very generous and nice. So we look forward to continuing to practice here for, for quite some time. Um, that being said, it was a little bit of an interesting uh, launch off for us. We actually took over an old escape room space, which was a little odd in its layout, some of its features. So um, not something that we walked into and could immediately imagine ourselves you know, building a practice and growing into the space. So it, it took a lot of work. I mean, we had contractors in here. We were doing a lot of the uh, manual labor work ourselves. So here's some photos of just how that kind of took off. You know, it was, it was a complete renovation, complete gut and rebuild. Um, and it, it wasn't something that we envisioned having to design our own space. So that was kind of fun uh, in the meantime, as we were kind of um, working on building this company and building this practice. Um, after things, things are turning out pretty nice. Uh, we've still got some things that we want to put into place. But, you know, every day we learn a little bit more. It's kind of like moving into a new house. You figure out things that you don't have that you need and um, kind of implement those things moving forward. But it's a large space. Um, we've got a lot of room to grow. Um, we plan on bringing in massage therapists. We've got uh, some open rooms in the back. And it also allows us the opportunity to bring in doctors in the future once our practice continues to grow. So what exactly do we do? Um, our, expert, our expertise is more natural spine care. Um, and I say natural because it's more of a, a hands-on approach. Like I said, we, we don't prescribe medication. Um, we refer out for that if necessary. And everything we offer is just a little bit more in uh, the holistic realm, which like we said, starting out conservatively is definitely uh, where the research shows is the best place. So we, we see a lot of neck pain, back pain, you know, patients coming with headaches, sciatic nerve irritation, whiplash, uh, disc herniations, which kind of really uh, resonate with myself. A lot of my postdoctorate uh, work and studies have been in uh, conservative management of disc herniation. Spinal stenosis, postural strain, just to name a few. But we like to throw ourselves out there as more or less the, the expert in neck and back pain. You know, we treat knees and shoulders, um, but typically if it's something that um, needs a little bit of attention, I'll recommend they go see someone who works on knees and shoulders every single day. Um, and uh, that's just kind of how we operate around here. So comprehensive spine care, you know, like we mentioned, chiropractic treatment, acupuncture, rehab, yoga, overgreenness, massage therapy. Um, but let's dive into chiropractic care a little bit more and, and what that entails and kind of our approach to chiropractic care, our, our clinical thought process per se. So according to our uh, National Association, the American Chiropractic Association, the word chiropractic comes from uh, Greek terminology, which translates into done by hand, which is what we do every single day. We get hands on with patients. Um, Dee Dee Palmer is the founder of chiropractic, performed the first chiropractic adjustment in 1895. So, you know, a little over a hundred years old, things have changed a lot. Talk about research and evidence and it's chiropractic is a lot more than just, you know, adjustments, um, which is kind of what we're known for, for good reason. It's a very powerful tool. But in that last paragraph there, you see that, you know, it's kind of developed into a lot more than just the adjustment. There's a lot more that we can offer. And I think the biggest thing that we can offer is, well, getting the patient to meet their goals and get back to where they want to be, but allowing them and providing them with the tools they need to maintain outside of here with, without necessarily needing us, so more self-management. And a lot of it's education too. And the spine is a, it's a relatively complex structure. It's a very important structure in our body. Um, and it has a very significant role. And the tricky part is we can't see our own spines. 
Um, so it's really difficult to say what the general health of our spine is unless we start experiencing symptoms and having pain. So education is very large. I mean, we don't do a lot of imaging here. A lot of chiropractors will take a baseline x-ray and move forward with that. Um, and that's warranted in certain, certain cases, but you know, here we like to just really educate the patients on what's going on in their body and how they can go about getting back into a good position, but maintaining and managing without our help. So a little anatomy lesson here, we'll just kind of get into a few things. Um, the spine is broken up into three different regions. Essentially, there's 24 bones or vertebrae that comprise the uh, spinal column. Why is the spinal column so important? Uh, essentially, it, it houses our spinal cord, which has very important roles with our brain, um, sending and receiving signals to the rest of our body, muscle control. It innervates a lot of the internal organs. But a couple of structures that we work with the most or the structures that bring in patients because they are causing pain, discomfort, like we said, limitations in their, their activities of daily living and work are the discs of the spine which are more or less our shock absorbers, um, the foramen of the spine, which are the exit space for the nerve roots or the attachments to the spinal cord. Um, we'll dive in a little bit deeper to some of those things. Another one would be the, the joints of the spine. You know, that's what a lot of those chiropractic adjustments are geared towards. We get most of the mobility in our trunk, all of the movements from the joints in the spine. So those are things that can, you know, become unhealthy with certain lifestyles and you know, other comorbidities and things going on and the whole kind of clinical picture. On the right there, there's a little bit of a depiction of our nervous system, which is essentially what our spinal cord houses and protects. Um, so, you know, if a patient comes in with pain on the bottom of their foot, depending on where that pain or where those symptoms are, we can trace that up to their lower back because all those nerves that come out of the spine in the lower back travel down into the foot control those muscles and control the function. So a lot of these things, you know, in the extremities and the head, they can all be traced back to the spine. So it's a good place to start investigating to see if that's what's causing the issue at hand. That's the patient's presenting with. So how do we look at it? We look at it as kind of a pain puzzle. You know, most patients come in here and their primary complaint is I'm in pain and I want to get out of pain. So as far as that goes, we're, we're puzzle people. I, I enjoy doing puzzles. I kind of look at each new patient walking in the door as a puzzle that needs to be solved. We need to gather some clues. So a couple of ways we initially gather clues are, you know, doing a medical screening, looking at vitals, seeing if there's any family history of any major medical concerns, um, as well as, you know, comorbidities, those types of things that could be influencing or uh, manifesting their pain or their symptoms. Observation plays a big role. You know, as soon as they walk in the front door, we can tell a lot, you know, do they take care of themselves? How's their hygiene? How's their gait? Um, and a lot of those simple things can also really correlate closely along with how they're feeling. Um, and a good history, you know, where is your pain? What's going on? What started it? How long has it been going on for? All those things can, kind of be a, a good clue that'll give us some further information on how to solve the puzzle. If warranted, we'll do a good neurological evaluation, you know, make sure that their nervous system is up to par with reflexes, muscle strength, and some other things, as well as a physical evaluation, you know, getting hands-on and um, feeling the joints, feeling the muscles, feeling that area and figuring out, you know, what's not quite right here and what can we do to correct that function, and restore some balance to that area. So after we've accomplished all that, we move on to the next step and we start kind of going through our clinical thought process, which in my opinion can be broken up into three major questions. Uh, the first one, you know, is this a medical concern? Is this something that we cannot manage underneath, you know, in these walls? Is there something that needs to be referred out, uh, whether to a medical doctor, medication, uh, whether the emergency room for some immediate um, immediate attention. We can find those things through clues such as vitals, you know, red flags in the health history, medications. And the way we always frame it is, you know, 
uh, Spider-Man, those spidey senses start to tingle. Something just doesn't quite feel right. Something doesn't quite add up. And if that's not the case, then we start to go on to question two and say, well, where, where is the pain coming from? Or where is the dysfunction coming from? And with a good history and exam, I would say about 95% of the time, we've got a pretty good indicator of what some of the uh, leading culprits to their issues are. Um, so that way we can kind of formulate a good, good approach to getting them back to where they want to be as quick as possible. And the last one would be, why are the symptoms persisting? Why isn't the body able to handle and manage these things on its own and get it to resolve on its own? And there's a lot of things that can play into that. Um, most importantly, probably that well, lifestyle and probably that last one, the BPS model, uh, the biopsychosocial model, where there's more and more research coming out every day about how much a lot of the psychological factors, a lot of our social surroundings and history can really attribute and, and help manifest a lot of these conditions. So telling the patient that this is totally normal, these things happen, uh, and we've got some solutions for you. And we want you to be a pretty active part of this care um, so we can make it long lasting and uh, educate you on how to how to really diminish these things from reoccurring. So almost like a little detective work as well. But when we look at the spine in general, there's, you know, after we've kind of crossed off question one, we start to investigate, you know, is this spinal referred pain? Which could mean a lot of different things. Um, and, and give or take, there's only about four or five pain generators in the spine that we need to investigate. And there's simple testing. Um, there's other simple signs and things that we can put into play to identify which one of these may be the primary contributor to their issue. Uh, the first one is the joint. Like we said, a lot of movement comes out of the spine. Each one of these vertebrae or these bones, they have four joints. So that gives us a lot of that mobility. And if there's lacking mobility, if there's stiffness with certain movements, we're going to investigate the joints, the joint movement, and try to figure out you know, why this is happening. They started it, but furthermore, and, and first to the point is how are we going to get it feeling better and get it to resolve? The second one is the disc or our shock absorber in the spine. I'm sure most of you have heard, you know, bulging discs, herniated discs. Um, they're a structure that can cause a lot of debilitating pain. Um, and that being said, you know, low back pain is actually the leading cause of disability and leading cause of lost work uh, in the United States. So this is a, definitely something that we need people in the right position to be able to diagnose and treat and manage properly because it is a pretty widespread problem. Uh, and then the nerve root, that's that yellow portion here, the attachment to the spinal cord. And that's where we get some of those sciatic type symptoms that a lot of people have heard of, you know, pain going down the leg, whether it's numbness and tingling going into the arm, headaches, all those things are more nerve root derived symptoms if that gets irritated due to changes in the spine. And then lastly, you know, muscle tissue plays a big role in mechanics and structure as well. Not typically a very leading cause of pain, but a lot of people do respond really well if some sort of muscle muscle attention is incorporated into the treatment plan. So deciphering, you know, which one of these are present and to what extent is going to dictate how we treat and how we manage these patients and dictate a lot of what we have them doing outside of the clinic to stay proactive in their health. So solving that puzzle, once again, back to the puzzle piece, it starts with a good diagnosis. There are a lot of the workup that we mentioned that would happen on that first visit due to that diagnosis and what we've come away with, that's gonna really, you know, that's gonna really lead us to what the proper treatment for these things are and, and some options. And options are nice, not everyone responds to the same thing. So it's great to have those tools in your toolbox to be able to try to introduce different things to accelerate that process of healing. Um, and no one leaves here without a good at-home program, you know, whether that's, whether that's you know certain ways to lift weights, some stretches at home, a lot of ways to strengthen the core to protect the spine. Um, we like patients to stay very active in their care and be a big part of that. And the last thing is lifestyle changes. That's the majority of what brings patients in here. 
you know, very, I don't want to say rarely, but usually it's not someone who fell and had an acute injury. You know, we treat motor vehicle accidents, those types of things. But usually what we see in here, the presentation is something that's just gradually building up. You know, we can't identify one certain cause, one certain incident that led us. Um, I always kind of laugh. One thing I hear and hear multiple times a day is I must have slept wrong, which could very well be the case. But there's probably something that was manifesting beforehand in order for that to come to light um, with something as simple as sleep. So. You know, that's the biggest, toughest question to answer in here is why is this happening to me? So that's why exploring all these different avenues, digging a little bit deeper, helps us kind of try to identify maybe that, you know, cumulative, repetitive stressor that's going on that's bringing about these symptoms in the first place. So a couple of things that have been keeping us busy in here. Uh, Know, this article just came out in December. I thought it was really interesting because we've been running into a lot of it here. And it's not only, you know, teachers. This uh, article kind of went to the relationship between neck and back pain and how it's been a lot more present in that teaching population as they've been doing distance learning. You know, I think that carries over to the majority of us in our fields. The Zoom has become very, very universal. That's how a lot of businesses are operating right now. A lot of meetings are going on that way. And um, a lot of us are kind of trapped at the computer and maybe not at our nice, you know, ergonomic corporate setup. We're at home on the couch with a laptop and we just don't quite know that we're putting a lot of stress on these final structures to symptoms and some issues down the road. So, uh, talking a lot about ergonomics and posture. What can we be doing in the meantime at home when we don't have access to, you know, that nice setup at work or we're not on our feet teaching these students? So a lot of people have uh, kind of fallen out of their routine and the body can really, really show that relationship and become under a lot more stress um, if we're not doing the right things. So once again, that education piece is absolutely important if we identify that as being one of the leading causes. A couple other interesting research articles that I was been reading here over the last few weeks. Um, there's always new stuff coming out, which is why I love this field. Uh, there's, there's, there's never a lack of information. You think you got everything figured out and then more information comes out that you can kind of implement and, and put into play. Um, so that first one there, cervical spine or the neck, uh, pathology increases the risk of rotator cuff tear. So that just kind of shows the correlation between the neck and like we said, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's relationship to the upper body, the arm, the shoulder. If one area in the spine is not working well, we're gonna have some repercussions in other areas. It's big balance, the spine's all one structure. That second study there, initial choice for spinal manipulation therapy, which more or less, you know, means adjustments, you know, the, in general, hands-on work with patients um, for the treatment of chronic low back pain leads to reduce long-term risk of adverse drug events, uh, especially in that older Medicare population, which is a huge topic right now. It has been for the last, you know, five, 10 years, opioids. Um, you know, a lot of patients are trying to seek out a little bit more of a natural approach instead of, you know, going and getting medication that they're a little bit concerned about what the side effects are. And, you know, is this something that, I'm going to have to be on long term. So I think to me, this is important because if someone came up, say, like we said, Brent woke up this morning and he had some really bad low back pain that he didn't know what was going on. Now, let's say he went to his medical doctor um, and medical doctors are great. They do a fantastic job, but I think they would be the first one to tell you that they, they don't specialize in neck and back pain. So, you know, they're probably going to offer up some medications, which can be very helpful to reduce your symptoms. But at the same time, you know, I think it'd just make more sense to go see someone who works on necks and backs all day long um, and kind of get those, you know, get those results a little bit quicker and some education um, versus just going right into medication right off the bat. So a lot of people are seeking out those uh, natural health alternatives, which has been 
uh, a good trend to see. Um, and there's a lot more awareness about you know, chiropractic care and, and what we can offer in that realm. And the last one there, another one, just kind of looking a little bit more at the medical costs, you know, surgery versus a non-surgical treatment, um, especially in the lower back for some degenerative changes. Um, and what that showed us is it's just, it's a lot more cost effective, not only for the patient, for the insurer and for the system in general. You know, if you start out with some of those conservative approaches, the majority of those cases, you know, they don't end up going down that path of consistent medical care, you know, surgeries, rehabilitation. So offering that up to patients as an alternative is really important as well. Uh, in general, like I said, we're newer here in Golden Valley. Um, we're, we're working on you know, getting some more visibility, shaking the bushes a little bit so we can help serve the community and, and uh, get more people in here, spread the word a little bit. Um, and things like this are very helpful. So I appreciate you uh, inviting me to present today. And uh, yeah, if you don't mind, spread the word a little bit. Um, don't have any cards to hand out over Zoom or anything, but you can find our, uh, our website there, some of our contact information. And uh, yeah, we'd be more than willing to help out um, anyone who, who comes in and we've identified that this is a good fit and a good place for them to be. So I think that's pretty much it. I, I appreciate your time. I'm not not sure how far did we end up going. Oh, pretty good. Kind of around that half an hour mark. How about that? That was great. Very informative. Uh, anybody have any qu questions for Dr. Klask? What what causes the curvature of the spine, and and can you avoid that from keep that from happening? Great question. So if we look at that slide again, that curvature that we look at, kind of from that side view there, that is actually all normal. We want that curvature. So even all of us sitting right now, if you're to sit up straight, you kind of feel that low back curve. It should be a bit of a dip in, or in that middle back, it rounds out and your neck dips back in. So it's almost like a large S curve. What's important about that is it, it helps absorb shock essentially. If you've got that curve, just like this here, and there's always all this repetitive stress, gravity and compression going on with a lot of our activities and sitting, standing, that curve can do one of these to absorb a lot of that impact. Versus if that curve straightens up over time, which is a normal wear and tear process, it can't really absorb that compression as much. So a lot of those structures we talked about, the disc, the joint, they have to work hard and they get under a lot more stress, irritation, inflammation. And that can cause a lot of those symptoms. That can cause a lot of those structures to become symptomatic. But if you were to turn that spine around and say we were looking at it you know, to the front or from the back, that's where we would see, you know, maybe a scoliosis would be a, that type of curvature change, which is something that's usually more or less kind of set in stone around that age 20, 21 is where our spines fully mature. So catching that early on in adolescence and the pediatric population, we can make some nice changes before that spine fully matures. But the way we look at it right here is we want to maintain and re really restore these curves. That's why a lot of those nice office chairs have the lumbar support, you know, things to feed into those curves that helps keep those mechanics healthy. Excellent. Well, thanks so much. And uh, we look forward to uh, when weather gets a little nicer and you have the open house, uh, getting more people to that. And, um, and, sure. and yeah, thanks, thanks for the comprehensive presentation. I was like paying a lot more attention to my back during this meeting than I guess I normally do. Yeah, that's uh, one of the funniest things. As soon as you walk into the treatment room, everyone starts to sit up straight. I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. <laughs> um, well, let's move on to uh, to the city, the M&M. Uh, Maurice, you want to go first and then Mark? Sure. I'm trying to knock out some, you know, big to small, small to big. Um, at least Denise Blamir Anderson um, sworn in earlier this month. So she is new on city council, already having a major impact um, in deliberation. So glad to have her aboard. Um, as you know, Larry Fadis decided to retire. <laughs> um, good for him. A um, couple of big things, honestly, the mask mandate, we've 
um, decided to, re to reinstall one um, due to high case counts um, in the region. Um, it's a way to hopefully to tamp down on some of that. Um, we've been contacted by residents, businesses alike about, you know, pro con. Um, hopefully we're trying to go by data based from the Hennepin County on cases per 10,000 um, residents. The goal they said is 50. Um, and so hopefully the next few weeks as cases start to subside, um, we'll be able to lift the mandate. Um, you know, some businesses say it's been good for them, obviously, because safety. Others say, you know, some people will not, will not go because of a mass mandate. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a wash <laughs> to say the least. Um, but, you know, I think it's, 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 you know, we don't do this because we want to do it, do it because we have to, <laughs> which is what's been going on the last month with Omicron. So um, that was the big thing we've, you know, one of the big things we did. Um, also, um, the opt-in site, we've, City Council approved a rezone to light industrial. Uh, we have properties that's planning to build a um, two, around 200,000 square feet buildings on that site, um, tearing down the current building, obviously. Um, and Mark, follow up when, you know, if things go along with schedule with, you know, construction probably will start sometime this summer. Um, we're already kind of working with um, some of our partners at Greater MSP um, to kind of, you know, who do we want to attract to these buildings? Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, there's really not many sites like this inside of 494 Loop. Um, try to bring some of those businesses who left to, you know, the Maple Groves and Brooklyn Parks to come back to Golden Valley because um, it's a great location, it's a great site. So that is currently in the works as well. Um, we passed our legislative projects uh, priorities for this upcoming year. Um, big one is one is fire station, uh, remote fire station. Um, as we're looking to switch to, switch, switch to duty crews, um, our current structure is they have nowhere to sleep if they stay overnight, um, kind of an issue. So if we, um, we're going to submit um, some requests for bonding money for a new fire station this upcoming year, um, as well as we're looking at doing local option sales tax. Um, you know, as we did last year, we we did our studies, our facility studies, um, and downtown study as well. Um, the need for a new, you know, campus for our public works. Um, you know, currently it's downtown and with city hall and such. Um, moving to a better site, which is new facilities. The ones we have are smaller, outdated. You know, we're doing as best we can with them, but um, it's time for an upgrade. And so hopefully with, you know, passing local option sales tax, um, not just putting a burden on, you know, residents to keep increasing property taxes, um, as well as hopefully getting funding down the road via bonding and via other sources to help them move along. Um, as well as, you know, City Hall and police and fire uh, with public safety. So we're in a process of um, trying to get them to ballot, hopefully by I think the end of the year, early next year, uh, depending on the calendar with elections. Um, also, VRT is one as well. Um, you know, you know we're discussing Southwest. Hopefully it won't be as long as Southwest, <laughs> um, but hopefully along the 55 corridor. Um, we got money last year uh, via the state budget for to do a study on the viability of that. Um, hopefully this year we kind of push that along to secure, you know, to build a building box, get funding for that. Um, I think it's a great, that'd be, I think it's a perfect opportunity with that corridor from a dying all the way to downtown connecting John centers. So we're really wanting to kind of push that along um, for transit needs and Golden Valley as well. Um, I think those are the major ones. I don't Mark, if I missed anything or misinterpreted details that I thought I knew. <laughs> no, I think uh, I think you you caught the ones that were uh, definitely on on my mind. Um, I would just maybe add the uh, the office warehouse um, uh, project at the uh, Optum site is is really significant. We have lost a number of businesses in Golden Valley and a number of of opportunities. Um, because we just simply don't have contemporary industrial office space with the proper 
you know, con, you know, contemporary clear heights and, and things like that. And, you know, I know that there have been, you know, some questions about, well, is, is this just going to be an, uh, an Amazon warehouse? And we don't believe that that is, uh, you know, we've actually in, in some of our conversations with greater MSP talked a little bit about the demand for lab space that exists um, in the metro area. And uh, we think this can be a really exciting um, place to uh, to add business and create jobs, which has been the the vision for that area in the the Douglas Drive corridor for for quite a while. So this is this is significant. Um, we also um, have a proposal from the uh, well uh, lifestyle properties looking at doing a, um, a senior co-op in the south east quadrant of the uh, Golden Valley Country Club, just south of their driving range. They're going to carve off a couple of acres and um, and uh, you know see some see some financial benefit from a land sale. And then uh, I think we're we're this was not in our comp plan. Let's put it that way. So there's been a lot of discussion around is this an appropriate land use in, in the area? But in terms of a product coming to Golden Valley, um, having a, a senior co-op um, with some affordability um, in that in that mix is. Uh, is exciting and, and of, of interest. So um, that is moving forward. Uh, the other thing, maybe just to, to tout to our own horn a little bit, uh, I suppose, is um, the council uh, decided to join with a number of other cities. I want to say about 34 other cities uh, around the state in, um, a, in declaring climate action emergency, um, essentially. And this, this ties into our environmental efforts in Golden Valley, and um, we did get some, some good press and hopefully um, can start to, you know, get, uh, get the ear of, of policymakers both in the state and, and in Washington. So I would, uh, I would probably, that's probably enough for this group. <laughs> They're probably some of the highlights. So thank you, Maurice. Well, well done. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to, to piggyback and in, in full the clearance, I work at Greater and Speed. So, um, and I just want to follow. There's many projects I've seen come through the door with Greater and Speed where, yeah, there, there's demand and it just, we just never had, you know, that kind of space available. So I'm really excited for this project actually. Um, I think we, it could definitely bring in, you know, drawing business from people who fur out, but also maybe attract you know, newer companies to move to the region too. So it, it's it's a good opportunity that I think it's at this point where, you know, there's 494, just there's, it's all built out. So I think this is kind of our, you know, this is our competitive piece we can definitely use to draw in some, you know, really great companies that would set up shop, you know, in, in the location close to downtown. That's great. Guys, anything else for Mark or Maurice? The uh, I assume state of the city early March again. Yeah, March fourth, I believe. Um, right. At Under Pressure Brewing. Um, okay. So three, three p.m. on a Friday at a brewery. You know, <laughs> I'll be there. I might be there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So yeah, well, keep, save the date. <laughs> that's, it's a hard turn to make to education on that note, but I'm going to do that <laughs> anyway. Uh, Katie, take it away. Right? I was thinking, oh, man, it's all going to go downhill from here. You, a Friday afternoon meeting at a brewery, I wish. Um, so a little update from Hopkins Public Schools. It's actually really funny. Every time we have this meeting, I sit down and I make notes and I, I immediately think, oh, there's not that much to report. And by the end of it, I have like a half a page of notes of things that to share with you guys. So I'll try and make it pretty quick. Um, right in the middle of budgeting season for our 22-23 school year, um, as well as I'm sure you guys are aware, um, advocating for some of that $7 billion surplus to go to education. I mean, <laughs> I think I, I, I think every you know month I talk to you guys about the budget, but we need it so badly, specifically um, in the plan, the things that for us, um, as a district in a lot of similar districts, the free lunch, making that full, like just part of the education policy is huge, as well as the um, portions around mental health and wellness support within schools, adding psychologist resources, um, social worker resources. So um, those are the, really the ones that stand out for us is what we would really like to see and would really help us. 
Um, so, you know, from a COVID perspective, we have not taken the district remote. Our junior high and our high school did go remote uh, due to staffing issues, but um, I believe they're back in, if, if not this week, next week. Um, I think the high school for sure is back because I saw a school bus drop ah. kids off yesterday. So I think okay. they're back. <laughs> I, yeah, it's it's funny, like time, even though COVID seems like it's our normal, time is still not moving normally for me. So um, uh, so a couple of like really, I think really fun things, um, our Royal Gala, which is our huge um, Hopkins Education Foundation Gala is on February 26th. Um, if you've never been, it's really fun. You can also attend virtually. Um, it, I can put beer in my update. Last year at the gala, we won... Um, a beer fridge through a bidding. We bid um, and won a beer fridge and like, I think it was like 300 bottles of beer. So, you know, I got it. There we go. Um, we also had um, Minnesota Public Radio highlighted our Gatewood outdoor immersion, kindergarten and elementary classes, um, which was very fun. Good press um, for us, as well as just, you know, us trying to innovate how we do school. Um, and I think really uh, the other really fun thing is that we approved finally, much to the chagrin of some parents, the 22-23 school year calendar. Um, it was a little later than usual, but we were working through some things. Um, the reason this is remarkable is we introduced three additional holidays to our calendar. So um, in next school year, our, um, we will be giving holidays for uh, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and um, Eid al-Fatir. So those three non-Christian holidays, very important for calendar equity for us. And we're pretty excited about it. Not to mention the families that this affects, like a lot of really good response from our community on that. Um, and then finally, I would say we just uh, did an equity audit. We had a team, it was supposed to be a year. We met with them um, in February of 2020 ended up being two years, but they came in and did an equity audit of our district. Um, this is a team of 11 doctors of education who have a lot of experience. Um, and we just really wanted an outside party to come in and talk to us about how we were doing from an equity perspective, since it is such a huge part of what we're doing as a district. What we learned is that um, despite a lot of training and professional development, we haven't taken that into action. So you know, they really gave us a gold star on providing the professional development, but um, taking training and putting it into action was an area we needed to focus. Um, they gave us recommendation to really start revamping our curriculum from an equity perspective. Um, policy review uh, across the district with an equity lens, uh, particularly around our discipline policy. Um, and then a change up in how we do our budget. The good news on all of this is we actually changed up our budget uh, and that's been totally revamped in exactly the way they wanted us to. So we'd already done that as of last year. Um, we're already reviewing all policies with an equity lens. So we've already started that as well. So it was kind of, it was reassuring that some of the stuff we're doing is right, but it was also really great for us to get a roadmap of where we need to improve from an equity perspective. I think that's everything. That's great. Any questions? Oh, thanks, Katie. Katie, Katie, just out of curiosity, are, are you still looking at a, a year round school model or what's sort of the, the trajectory for that? Yeah, so that one doesn't, um, it would be just one of our elementaries. Um, it wouldn't be all six. It would be just one. And frankly, I mean, if I were to be a Betton gal, I would say it would be our language immersion elementary because of the learning loss those students experience over the summer from a language acquisition perspective. That said, it's kind of on the table. If there's interest from the parents, there would be one elementary that we would push into a year round model, um, but that's tabled for after the grade transition of sixth graders to middle schools and ninth graders to the high school, if we do it. So that would put it out until the 24, 25 school year. So we're still evaluating A, desire and B, ability. Great, interesting. Betsy, your dual hats. Thank you. I'm going to, yeah, I'll put my, my Perpich hat on first. And um, just a quick kudos to Katie for, for, you know, folding in a beer fridge into the update. Impressive. Impressive that 9.22 in the morning. <laughs> 
Um, so a couple of quick updates from Perpich Center for Arts Education. Our Perpich Arts High School does take students from across the state, but each of those students has to apply to attend Perpich. We are a high school specific for juniors and seniors who want to focus on one of six art areas. And that admissions deadline is coming up. It's February 1st, so it's already next Tuesday, right? Yeah, next Tuesday. Um, so admissions um, applications have been coming in this month. We had another virtual info session last night and our admissions director has been giving um, individualized tours of campus um, pretty much every day, it feels like this month. So it's been exciting to see that interest continue for Purpich Arts High School. We did have a really, um, I guess significant is an okay word, a significant bump in our in our um, admissions last year, it was over 20% increase, so that was exciting. Um, I'm not sure if we'll keep pace with that for, for next school year, but we are definitely feeling that trajectory going up and it's um, just very positive. And we also added a brand new track this school year, a musical theater track under the umbrella of our, of our theater um, program. And that the first year of that, you have to be a junior to apply because it is a two year program. Um, we had 10 students accepted into that program this year. Um, and so looking to build on that for next year. And we just finished um, a, a promotional video actually with Captivate Media, which is right in Golden Valley, um, just down the road from us and um, launched that at the end of December. And so we've been pushing that out uh, over, the, over the interwebs um, as we lead up to that February 1st admissions deadline. And we will have a second deadline. The, the date is escaping my mind at this moment, but it will be, I believe it's April. So I'll have an update later on that. If you're looking for a little bit of culture this evening, we do have a studio arts exhibition that is opening tonight from 5 to 7 p.m. at Perpich Arts High School. Um, all of our media arts and visual arts students are presenting work that they have done over the last quarter um, in their classes. So there's a curriculum exhibition in the upper gallery. In the lower gallery, it's the at home, beyond the classroom exhibition. So each student gets to pick one piece that they've been working on outside of the classroom, uh, something that's important to them that they wanted to, to show off. So we have two exhibitions opening tonight. Um, five to seven is the exhibition opening. And then that actually, um, those two galleries will be open until March 11th. So if you are interested in coming to campus some other time, reach out, we can schedule a time for you to be there and take a look at, at the very impressive work that our students are doing. We were pleased to be included in Governor Walz's bonding, bonding bu budget, so that five times fast, um, bonding budget for um, a dollar amount of, I think, three million. Um, we had requested just, just north of four million, so we were, you know, we're happy to be included, um, and we'll see how that shakes out with the legislative session and, and as other um, requests come in, but we definitely have um, some, some projects um, that need attention um, in our structures. We have, if you've not been to campus, we have three um, large buildings on campus. We have the main building that has our high school. We have a dormitory on the back part of our campus. And then we have a third building where our professional development staff have all of their offices and, and all of their um, workshops. So we do have buildings that are date, dated and dating. Um, so it would be good to get some of that attention to them. And our Highway 55 and Douglas, uh, Douglas Drive underpass project continues forward. Um, we have, um, I guess, technically, you know, partnership with the city, with MnDOT, um, and with Perpich and putting in an underpass at that intersection. Um, we had hoped to do an open house on campus in early February. Um, and with COVID, the numbers um, being at, at what they are, the decision was made to instead do that as in a virtual setting. Um, so there's a, a, I think maybe a virtual open house happening um, over the next couple of weeks to get some community input as that project um, continues to move forward. So that's my purpose presentation. Anybody questions for that part? <laughs> All right, so hat, rotary hat, good. Um, just a couple of teasers for the next couple of weeks of, of speakers. Um, next Tuesday, February 1st, we are welcoming um, David Engstrom, who is the superintendent of the Robbinsdale area schools as our speaker. 
So he'll be giving us an update on the Robbinsdale district. Um, and that's a, a, a reminder for us as this group, we need to reconnect with Robbinsdale and, and get um, a Robbinsdale representative because we haven't had one for several months at this group to, to give us those monthly updates. Um, and then the following week, February 8th, um, again, Rotary always meets over the noon hour Tuesdays at Brookview. Um, the following Tuesday, the 8th, we have um, Christina Woodley from the Bridge for Youth coming to do a presentation. And our Rotary Club has been fortunate to do a couple of projects with the Bridge for Youth over the years. Um, the most recent one that I can remember was putting together um, pajama packets so that when students come to the Bridge for Youth, they've got a packet, with some brand new pajamas, their brand new undergarments, socks, um, because sometimes they're coming with not a lot. Um, and so we wanted to provide them with something clean and fresh and, and their size. So that's a, a fun project we've been able to do. And so it'll be a good presentation from the Bridge for Youth. And something I wanted to tease out there because um, we're, we're submitting the permit this week to the city. So I, I don't wanna say this is official because we don't have the official word yet, but we are hoping to resurrect Taste and Tour this year. The last time that we had Taste and Tour was the summer of 2019. And um, we had started the work planning uh, Taste and Tour 2020, of course, in, in winter, and we all know what happened. So we do hope to have a Taste and Tour 2022. And the projected date that we have for that would be Thursday, July 28th. Um, and so that is an opportunity um, afternoon and evening where we really um, we work with all of the businesses along that 55 and uh, Winnetka Corridor um, to feature their businesses. It's a great community event. It's free. Uh, you come out, you, you have a little passport, you go business to business, you learn a little bit about what they do. Uh, oftentimes there have been, if it's a restaurant, there have been free samples, which is always kind of fun. Um, and um, it's just a great community night. And we hope to partner with PRISM again and do, um, you know, wrap in a fundraiser for PRISM in that same event and feature all of the great businesses that we have in this community. So you can pencil it in Thursday, July 28th. And um, we hope to have the, the paperwork and the, the final, like you got it from the city soon that I can say you can write it in pen. So that's what I've got. And membership is open for the Rotary Club. I'll just say membership is open, you know, come and yeah. see us. <laughs> That's 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 great, Betsy. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm. Everybody's got their fingers crossed that uh, you know the events start, and uh, are, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of pent up energy for that kind of uh, get together as well. So, Absolutely. yeah. And let, and you know we can be thinking about what are the what are the best ways that the, that the business council might be able to um, partner and support that event because it is such a great business focus event that I think it it pairs quite nicely with this group. Yeah. Well, uh, I know we're a little over. I just a uh, couple th quick things from the chamber. Um, you know, we're uh, we have a uh, in February. Uh, Elevate Futures uh, has a, a program on the third uh, Thursday. I think that's the seventeenth. Um, that's uh, virtual. That uh, you might want to check out a talent pipeline. That skills gap question, which is um, you know even more interesting now, I think, than probably ever. And, and needed to address. Um, we've also started a, a West Metro monthly membership meeting, um, also the third Thursday, usually over lunch. So if you have ideas for um, uh, speakers or locations, um, uh, whether it's Golden Valley or other cities, and I know the February one is gonna be in Plymouth, but we're gonna move it around. Um, and then our annual meeting, which was scheduled for next week, uh, we pushed back to February 23rd uh, at the Fillmore uh, because we really, we really do want to have it in person. And, uh, and that's going to be more of a kind of a, a fun, uh, almost like tonight's show, late night show kind of uh, format to it. Um, so put that on your calendars as well. And uh, and then the other thing too is, and this is not just a Bloomington thing; it's a it's a statewide thing. If uh, any of you are interested in knowing people who might be interested in learning more about Minnesota's Expo 2027 bid, um, we're going to have a virtual, uh, actually a hybrid program on that on February uh, 11th. Um, you know, there's uh, it, that bid will be made official uh, later this year, and if Minnesota gets it. Um, 
you know, kind of all hands on deck to uh, expose uh, this area to the world, um, you know, in a few years. So, um, you know, what may have started out as Mark Ritchie's pipe dream may actually turn into a reality. So um, if anybody's interested, check that out. Um, anything else for the greater good before we close it out? Our next meeting date, Brent, would be... February 24th, I think. And like yes. I said, I'm, I'm planning to be back in person at Brookview. So yep. Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll hope for that. I think good thoughts on that. Well, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Dr. Kless, for the presentation. That was great. And everybody have a great day. Thanks so much. Stay warm, stay well. Take care.